Okay, hey everyone, I'm Pastor Dawn Davis Lawrence, and it's great to be here with you today. Absolutely wonderful. What I want to deal with today is 10 ways to recognize that your pastor is jealous of you. Mm, that's a difficult one. It's a hard one to swallow, but at the end of the day, you know, we're all human and it's in the word. We're in the book. We're in the book. I'm not going to take you anywhere that's not in the book. So stay there and I'm going to come right back to you. Okay. Hey, thank you so much for joining me. I'm Pastor Dawn Davis Lawrence. 10 ways to recognize that your pastor is jealous of you. First Samuel chapter 18 tells us about David and Saul, King Saul. And King Saul, after promoting David, hmm, became jealous of him. It's something that happens regularly in our churches. And it's a difficult one to overcome, particularly if you're young in ministry and you're coming up or you love your pastor and you love being around your pastor, he or she, and you, you can't figure what's going on. You, you can't put your finger on it. You daren't, you daren't consider that it might be jealousy, but guess what? It might be jealousy. What you're dealing with might be jealousy. And let me show you how you're going to know that it's jealousy, because one thing you'll know about jealousy is that it has traits and it doesn't matter if the person's black, white, or polka dot. <laughs> it has traits, okay? That jealous spirit has traits, whether it's a male or in a female, whether it's presenting in a in in whatever nationality, in whatever uh, faith you're in, all right, whatever denomination you're in. Jealousy has traits. You'll be able to recognize it, right? And I want to be able to point it out to you now. What you do with that is another session, okay? How you handle that is another session. The word tells us that David behaved himself wisely. You don't fight fire with fire, all right? Because God is the greatest recycler you can, you'll ever meet, all right? So he can take someone's jealousy and he can use that for your good. And you gotta jump into Romans 8 and 28 and know that all things, doesn't matter what it is, where it is, how it feels, whether it feels good, whether it feels bad, whether it feels terrible, it's working for your good. God's going to make sure that whatever it is that you're facing in your life, it's working for your good. So 10 ways to recognize that your pastor is jealous of you. And, and you're going to see me coming and looking across here because I've got to <laughs> <laughs> because, yeah, I can't retain everything up in my mind all the time, all right? So it's difficult to it's difficult to comprehend or even to consider that your pastor could be jealous of you, particularly if you love that individual and there's pretty much nothing that you wouldn't do for them and that you're in that church because you love them, because you love the ministry. But if there's a call on your life, and oftentimes jealousy shows up in the lives of believers and particularly leaders against their peers or someone who's subordinate to them because there's a call, a mighty call on that person's life. And so consequently, a door opens inside of them. They open a door. They give the enemy access to use them to try to destroy you. It's sad, it's unfortunate, but it's a fact of life and it's a fact of your walk with God. And the sooner that you can recognize jealousy, you'll stop calling it something else and you'll know how to handle that thing, right? Because if you don't know what you're dealing with, then how will you know how to deal with it? Yeah. And I don't want you getting depressed and cast down and thinking that, you know, something wrong with you. If in fact you're dealing with the spirit of jealousy. So how do you know? Number one, 
criticizing and undermining. What I wrote here is that when the spirit of jealousy is using the leader, what you'll find is that they they will find fault in everything you do. Nothing you do will ever be good enough. You'll never be able to please that individual. Consistently finding fault with your actions or your contributions, often in a way that feels unfair or overly harsh, um, it may suggest that they're jealous, right? And particularly if they're humiliating you in front of people, if they're calling you out, if they're, 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 they're making these little funny comments about something that you put your hand to, all right? So overly criticizing, it's not constructive criticism. Hmm, my phone, <laughs> let me come back. So when somebody continues to criticize and undermine you, so you have a role to play, but that person keeps on undermining you, the pastor's undermining you, so the decisions that you've made, they're overriding your decisions, that's undermining you, or they're publicly humiliating you, or they're criticizing what you've done, every little nook and every cranny, they're criticizing. Hmm, that's a trait of jealousy right there. Number two, then, is avoidance of acknowledgement. So a reluctance or a refusal to recognize your achievement or your contributions, even when others are praising you. There's no praise. There's no recognition. There's no acknowledgement of what you've done. So others get the acknowledgement. They get the praise. You find that. But you find that, mm -mm, they won't acknowledge what you've done. They won't praise you. This is not because you're you're wanting praise per se. You're not wanting a pat on the back, but you're finding that the pastor won't acknowledge anything that you do. In fact, they rather talk it down or totally and completely ignore it as though you hadn't done it. It's a trait. It's a sign that there's a jealous trait. There's a jealous spirit that's operating or that the pastor is allowing. If you remember David uh, in, in the scripture that I mentioned, others were praising him. And, and the moment that Saul heard it, he became jealous. Saul has killed his thousands. David has killed his ten thousands. That's what the women were singing as they were entering back home after a battle. And that the, a jealous spirit just took him right there. And it just got worse and worse and worse. Number three, exclusion. Deliberately excluding you from important meetings, events, or the decision-making process about the church. So everybody else is invited, but you're told last minute. So you don't get the opportunity to be there because your diary's packed. Oops, I'm sorry. You're being excluded from meetings that you're supposed to be in. You're hearing second-hand or third-hand or fourth-hand information that you're supposed to know about. You're not being included. You're being excluded. It is a sign that you're dealing with a jealous spirit. And more often than not, you call it something else. You look the other way. When you're dealing with a jealous spirit, you have to be able to recognize it and call it what it is. And then you can navigate your behavior, your actions, because you know what you're dealing with. But when you're calling it something else, when you're denying, when you're allowing or you're owning it as being, maybe it's just me, you know, maybe, maybe if I try to do this or maybe if I, no, it's not you. The pastor is dealing with or given place to a jealous spirit. Just because they're a pastor doesn't mean to say they're not prone to it mm, or it doesn't have, it can't have a foothold or indeed a stronghold in their life. Mm. Yeah, that's just how it is. All right. So number four, a dismissive attitude. So the pastor is displaying a condescending or a dismissive attitude towards your ideas, your opinions, your feedback. If you're trying to say something, they talk over you or they ask you to wait or, you know, we don't need your opinion on this occasion or anything that you say, they dismiss it. Yes, thanks so much for that. Mm, but not today. We don't we're, No, We're not talking about that right now. We don't need to hear that right now. Or could you hold your thought and they don't come back to you? 
you had your thought and they don't come back to you. You've got your hand up. You're trying to say something. They're dismissive of anything that you put forward. A dismissive attitude is a really difficult one. I mean, all of the points that I'm going to bring to you is difficult because you're going to want to retaliate. You're going to want to fight back. It, it's, it's really difficult um, when people are dismissive of you, but particularly your pastor, you know, and more often than not, it will be done in public. So, you know, so you'll have all of those kinds of emotions, the feeling of, you know, anger or confusion or self-doubt. It can start really beating you down. And this is why it's so important that you know what you're dealing with, because you do not want to be absorbing that and owning that as being yours, because what the enemy wants to do through it is to beat you down to make you doubt who you are, because if your pastor can't see who you are, right? If your pastor is being dismissive of you, criticizing, undermining you, avoiding, you know, giving you acknowledgement or giving some kudos, well done. Thank you so much for that. But you're not being thanked. You're not being acknowledged. You're being undermined. You're being criticized. You're going to start absorbing that if you're not careful, all right? So it's so important that you understand when this is happening, what it is. It's not the pastor. It's the spirit that he has allowed or she has allowed to find access in her or his life, okay? Number five, inconsistent treatment. So... Treating you differently compared to other members of the church, such as being overly critical, as I mentioned before, overly critical about you. Sometimes they're blowing hot and cold. So sometimes they're with you and other times they're not. You know, sometimes they're all over you and the next minute they don't. They're not. It's as if they don't know you. It's as if they not interested in you, it's as if you're not in the room, you know, they'll walk right past you and not greet you. Um, you'll go out to greet them. Maybe you'll go, you'll be so excited to see them. It'll be like, oh, hi, pastor. And it'll be just a blank face, cold. And I'm not talking about someone who's having issues that they're having issues. So this is something that's consistently happening. I'm not talking about somebody who is having their own personal issues. And so, you know, they're dealing with something. So it's not about you. No, I'm not talking about this. I'm talking about when you, when you see these things, not in isolation, but they're together. All right. When you see these things together, what you're doing right now is you're seeing the spirit of jealousy that is operating through this individual. So inconsistent behavior, they're blowing hot and cold. They're for you. They're not for you. They're with you. They're happy with you. They're not happy with you. They're pulling you in. They're pushing you out. And what that is, is it, it, when you're dealing with the spirit of jealousy, what you're dealing with is, is, is control. So this individual will do these things or this spirit that's using these, indiv these individuals will do these things because it's about control. Because the spirit of jealousy likes to be in control. It doesn't like to feel like it's out of control or it's not it, the, 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 the chief, the head not the one that's being seen. The spotlight is not on them. It's on you. So whilst they're doing this kind of criticism, undermining, avoidance, not acknowledging you, this exclusion, this dismissive attitude, and, and this inconsistent treatment, what it's doing is it's controlling you. It's controlling your thinking. It's controlling your behavior. So this person is, it's, it's, it's almost a narcissistic trait, really, the jealous spirit is a narcissistic spirit, all right? And so what's happening is they're controlling your thinking. They're controlling how you behave. They're, they're in control. They're manipulating your mind and how you're thinking. And you go away thinking, was it me? Did I not greet them properly? I mean, what, what, what's wrong? Did I do something? Maybe, maybe I said something. Maybe... Hmm. Was I dressed properly? I do. So you start internalizing this stuff. And this is what this spirit of jealousy wants. And this is how you know it's operating in your past because it's about control and it's about power. 
So number six, gossip and slander. This is a big one. Spreading rumors or speaking negatively about you to others within the church community. Been there, experienced it, can tell you about this firsthand. All right. So so these little, little things that will be said, these innuendos. All right. Or just outright gossip. Trying to, again, control how people see you. They don't like the fact that people like you. This spirit doesn't like the fact that people like you, that you get on, that you're, you're a light, you're a rising star. And so to try to manipulate other people's thoughts concerning you against you. So they will insert gossip and insert some slander so that people think less of you. And this is how you know, like I said, you don't take these things in isolation. No, you don't. You, 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 this, this, this is building up. This is not, oh, just this one thing that's happening. But when you put all of these together, what you have is that your pastor is dealing with or not dealing with, but given place to an, a, a, a jealous spirit, a jealous spirit. So the, the, this, this, this gossip and slander, it can be really damaging. It can be so damaging and it's very difficult for you to be able to get up from underneath that. It's, it's highly likely that you'll have to leave that church because once the pastor, remember the pastor's the lead, you know, and once the pastor has manipulated people's minds against you, all right, putting in consistently, putting in gossip and slander about you. It's very difficult for people to see you in any other light. All right, let me give you an example. Don't think about the purple elephant. Do not think about a purple elephant. What are you thinking about right now? A purple elephant, right. Once I put it in there, it's difficult for you to think about anything else but a purple elephant. And so when someone begins to, you can't unhear things. So when someone begins to, particularly someone of authority, someone of influence like a pastor, begins to gossip and slander. And remember, gossip is, is, is truth with some elements of lie in it. It comes from a heart of malice. It comes from a heart of jealousy. That's what gossip is. It's different from just, you know, talking about, oh, Pastor Dawn, you know, let's have a chat about Pastor, you know, saw her yesterday. Oh yeah, she was driving her car and I saw her in town and I saw, that's different. Gossip is, did you see the car she was driving? I mean, my God, where did she even get the money from to buy that? And yet, she never has money. And what, I mean, really? I mean, she was even borrowing money from me the other day. That's gossip, right? You know why? Because it's coming from a heart that's bitter. It's coming from a place of malice. It's, it's, it's tearing down. It's not building up. That's gossip right there. Gossip and slander. They are kissing cousins. And if your pastor's engaging in this, it's coming from a heart of jealousy and bitterness towards you. And it'd be very, very difficult for you to achieve anything in that church. It'd be very difficult for you to do anything in that church because he's already or she's already ruined the hearts and minds of people towards you. All right. So the next thing is number seven is a competitiveness, engaging in unnecessary competition with you, trying to outdo you with various aspects of church life. So you find that if you put on something, they put it on, but on the same day. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I put that on. I didn't know you put something else on, but competing with you. So you know, so you go up and preach a sermon because you were supposed to preach the sermon and you hand back the service to them and they preach a whole message over your sermon that you just preached, or they'll go up or begin to correct you or correct the message. This competitive spirit, not trying to compliment you, but to compete with you. When you find that your pastor is competing with you, that's a jealous spirit that you're dealing with right there. That individual is jealous of you. So you have to open your eyes and your ears and be wise in everything that you're doing. You have to shut some things down. You have to stop sharing certain things with your pastor because 
we see what happened with Joseph, right? Joseph did not fully understand, comprehend that his brothers were jealous of him. All right. And with jealousy comes hatred. When jealousy is left to marinate, hatred will walk in with it as well. And so because and where there's hatred, <laughs> there, there's a murderous spirit that comes with hatred. And so because Joseph did not fully comprehend and recognize the depth of the jealousy that his brothers had, he kept sharing things with them and they hated him the more. So when you find that your pastor is jealous of you, it is important that you begin to shut some things down. Stop talking so much. Stop sharing much of your life. Stop sharing your personal intimate things with this individual because they don't have your back. And it's sad to say, it's sad to acknowledge this, but it is what it is. And you either learn this and live or not and, and, and end up in a pit somewhere, in a pit somewhere. All right. OK, and we preach about the pit as if it's supposed to be right. No, that was wickedness that threw Joseph in that pit. All right. And so God was able to get him through it. But had Joseph had somebody to sit him down and say, baby, stop talking, stop sharing. Maybe he wouldn't have ended up in the pit. Somebody might say to me, well, he wouldn't have got to the palace, please. He would have got to the palace, but just not through the pit. All right. So this number eight is micromanagement, excessively controlling your activities, your responsibilities, showing a lack of trust in your abilities, always questioning what you're doing, wanting to micromanage everything you do. Let me see it. Pass it by my eyes before you do anything with it. And not giving you that freedom of movement, even though you are accomplished, you've been in ministry for a good while, you know what you're doing. It's been given to you. You've done it before. You've proved yourself over and over. Over, but they're trying to micromanage you. Why? Because it's about power and it's about control and 100% it is underpinned by jealousy. Number nine, isolation tactics. So encouraging others to distance themselves from you. Yeah. Or not involving you in group activities or fellowship. They'll be encouraging. Oh, well, I wouldn't. I wouldn't go if I were you. Nah, no, nah, I I no. they're not that. She's not doing anything of any consequence. I wouldn't I wouldn't attend that conference. So trying to get people to not attend, sabotaging your meetings, trying to isolate you so that you're by yourself. And when you're by yourself, it's easier to just pick you off because, right, you're by yourself. So look at her isolating herself, not look at her being isolated by the pastor, but look at her isolating herself. So building up this picture of you that is a lion picture, but yet because of what they're doing, it looks real. It looks true. And finally, number 10. All right. Finally, number 10. Let me bring that up. A lack of support. So failing to support you in your times of need. So when, you know, I mean, deep need, they don't call. The pastor didn't call you, didn't pick up the phone, didn't call you, didn't visit, didn't show any concern, didn't buy you a card, wasn't there for you, didn't ask you if you were all right. Just no concern. It's as if nothing happened. You know, this was a massive need that you had. This was a massive catastrophe that happened in your life. This was something huge that happened, but they showed no concern whatsoever. No text, no phone call, no presence, no nothing. And when I say presence, I mean their presence, their physical presence, nothing, nothing is as if you didn't exist. You don't exist. Showing no compassion for you, showing no care for you, not asking you about your welfare. It's as if you're of no importance. All of these built up, put together, jealousy. Your pastor is dealing with jealous. Your pastor is jealous of you. And it happens, like I said, but it happened with David. But the word of God said, David behaved himself wisely. If you're dealing with right now, you know what David did? Let me just say this. This is not on my thing, but you know what David did? Um, there were times when Saul was good with him, all right, because the spirit then took him. And David would play the harp and play the harp and it would calm him down. And there were other times when Saul was throwing javelins at him. David had to run for his life and get up out of there. 
And there are some times when we stay in places for far too long. You got to get up out of there. You got to get up out of there. You got to get out. You got to get yourself away from that. If you found that this is consistently happening, this is not one year, a couple of months or so, but consistently, this is what's happening. Why are you still there? Maybe you're saying to me, well, I love the church and this is where I feel comfortable. Okay, no problem. But how are you dealing with that? And what impact is that having on your life and the purpose for which you were called? How you know your pastor is jealous of you? Jump back through those 10 points again. All right? Be blessed. I'm Pastor Dawn Davis Lawrence. This is where we rise, okay? This is where we rise. Thank you so much for listening to me. I will be back with more. God bless you. Stay safe. Stay sensible, stay strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Mm -hmm.